Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Move Forward Anyway podcast, featuring dream accelerating inspiration. I'm Jeff Meyer, your host, author, entrepreneur, and coach. My goal with this podcast is to help you identify and clarify your own dream by taking wisdom from others' successes and challenges. If you're looking to take action on your dream, to make a difference doing something you love, but your fears are holding you back, then this podcast is for you. If you're interested in finding additional support, you can also check out my Dream Accelerator coaching program designed to help realize your full potential and reshape your future. As always, you can learn more about my Dream Accelerator program at jeffmeyer.org. Using my Dream Accelerating formula, heart-centered entrepreneurs can focus on their dream, name their fears, change their mindset, define their next, and move forward anyway. Well, hello, fellow dreamers. Welcome back to another episode of Move Forward Anyway, and I'm excited uh, to talk with, have a conversation today uh, with Paul uh, Copeland from Florida. It's really great to have you here, Paul. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the to the group today? Thanks, Jeff. I uh, appreciate you having me on. This is terrific. Um, I'm Paul Copeland. I'm the co-owner of Sure Thing Cigars located on the panhandle of Florida on 30A on Florida's beautiful Emerald Coast. Um, And I co-own the store with country music star Luke Bryan. And he and I created this, um, created this dream and built this, um, this concept into reality and opened it uh, July 1st of 2016. Uh, Our, our business is set up to um, cigar lovers and people that want to come in and relax and enjoy a, a good atmosphere while either living in town or on vacation. Wow. So 2016, July 1st, you've been at this now five years uh, plus a month, right? Five years and a month. Yes. And uh, it, it's just, it's flown by. Talk to me about the genesis of the dream. Where did it start? You know, I have, I have loved cigars from a young age. Um, as a child, um, we lived out on a farm and my dad would ride around on his tractor and, and work and mow the back area and everything. And he'd always have a cigar lit. And he had this little cub cadet lawnmower that he had taken the, the deck off. And so I didn't mow myself up because there were no safeties on those things back then. <laughs> and um so he took the deck off of that and i followed him around on that little on that little cub cadet tractor while he was up on the big diesel tractor and i felt like i was doing something but i could always smell that cigar in the air and i think just smelling that then then we'd return the tractors to the barn there'd be cigar boxes sitting around with nuts and bolts and things like that in it. and so i just kind of always associated that with my dad Uh, I associated that with being a man, you know, living that type of life. And so when I got to high school, I went to an all male, uh, a Catholic high school. I was the only Protestant there, I think. Uh. (laughs) And uh, so we went, uh, I went there and, you know, of course, being a Protestant, I had to rock the boat a little bit. So I started a cigar club Thursday nights. Oh my um, gosh. uh, My junior year. And we would go to this little cigar shop uh, that was there in Columbus, Ohio. And we would sit in the back and because it was a private school, we'd all have on shirts and ties and, and stuff, you know, and, and um, it was kind of cool to be able to sit in the back of that cigar shop with our shirts and ties on and, and kind of talk with the guys, you know? And um, I think when you're, you know, 18, you know, and you're in high school uh, you know, no matter, you know, boy or girl, people just kind of say, okay, here comes some kids coming into the store, this and that. But when you sit in the back and you have a cigar in your hand lit up, it's a whole different experience. You're, you're, you're one of them. So fast forwarding that even through college, I started a cigar club in my fraternity there and we would do the same thing. Uh, we'd sit in the back of an old cigar store there in West Lafayette, Indiana, Purdue university. We'd watch cops and we'd, and we'd uh, <laughs> drink Coke out of a glass bottle and we'd smoke cigars. It was just that, that, that craving of, um, of being grown up. Um, you know, I always joked and said, man, when I'm about 65, I'd love to open up a cigar shop on the beach and play guitar at night. 
and own a cigar lounge. And that dream came about 35 years too soon. Um, uh, the concept of it and the beginning of it uh, all began in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I was a part of a cigar store there that I had with my father-in-law. And we created, we took an older store that had, that had, had the, not the best reputation. We purchased that and flipped it and made it a very welcoming and inviting place. And in that, I got to meet some great friends. And when time came for me to move on and to uh, move my wife and I um, and, and grow up a little bit more, um, one of my friends at that point uh, through cigars was Luke Bryant. So he and I were out, um, you know, and we would just have bonfires and, and fish and catfish and trout fish. So we were out trout fishing one day. It was the first day I ever caught a rainbow trout. <laughs> and I said, man, we ought to open up a place down by, you know, your vacation house down uh, on 30A. And we talked about it and we talked about how it would work and, and how it'd be laid out and the vision of making it very female friendly and, and clean and bright. And within two days we were on a plane and flying down to Florida. So looking at, looking at stuff. So that's the, that's the, the true, um, you know, the foundation, the genesis of, of, of where it began and, and how it began. So it, it started as a, a young man start as a child. Well, I, you know, I, and I had worked corporate jobs in, in between all of this. And I think that, that the biggest drive was, you know, Hey, Paul, where do you spend your time outside of work? And for me, you know, even in my little apartment, you know, at 20, 21, you know, 22 years old, um, you know, I, I would want to, you know, get cigar signs and put them up in my, you know, in my apartment. I would, I, I remember specifically, I, I saw a color on a cigar band that I fell in love with. And I took it to a paint store and I asked them to match this paint to the cigar band. And I painted my bathroom at my apartment. I got charged a ridiculous amount, by the way, when I moved out of that place to cover that up. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> but I absolutely, you know, it's it literally, I took that, I took that cigar band in and I said, I want this paint. And they made it for me. And, and I went, I painted my bathroom. I got a terrible job. I ruined everything in there. But I, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's always inside has been a, um, a part of me. And so outside of the corporate world, where did I spend my time? I loved smoking cigars. I loved hanging out and, and shooting the breeze. And so I said, you know, let's, let's take this, let's take my, my um, obsession and make it a profession. And that's what we did. Oh, I love that. Take my obsession and make it a profession. That's really cool. And so you're fly fishing or you're trout fishing with Luke. Mm -hmm. And you, you stirred up the conversation and said, we should do this. Yes. And, and it happened very, very quickly from, from what you just shared, like, mm -hmm. like two days, you were looking at property and stuff down in, in 30A. Absolutely. And it happened so fast. And, um, you know, I do believe that, um, you know, we, we still had diligence and patience as it related to our business plan and our in our concept. But one of the things that we did is we, and I think a lot of people make this mistake in business is that they begin to overanalyze and mm -hmm. work so hard at um, creating it unemotionally and making it purely analytical. And the entire reason why the dream ever came up and why there was ever excitement about anything is heart is emotion. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were able to look at that and truly it wasn't impulsive. There's a difference I think between making an impulsive decision and making a passionate decision. What made it not impulsive? It wasn't impulsive because we still, um, we did the work in those two days to, um, still lay out, uh, lay out risk, but we also did the work in those two days to still have the, um, excitement to still have the, um, you know, the, um, the novelty of it. Mm -hmm. And I think if we would have said, let's do it sometime next year, 
we would have had a year to rip the thing apart and figure out every way it could have gone wrong. Yep. And I think that's what so many dreamers do is they dream and then they take their dream. And that was an amazing dream. And they make it a nightmare because yeah. they sit there and they, they just harp on it for so long. We were able to take it and still keep the fun in it, still keep the excitement, the joy in it, and still, still take a look at a professional look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just, I truly feel that that's one of the reasons why, it became so successful is that we had a dream and we pounced on it. We didn't have a dream and sit Overthink and wait it. and see what happens. Right. Yeah. I find that a lot in my dream accelerator is the people that sign up are finally done overthinking and they want to help. I love what you said that dreams come from the heart and the mind tries to sometimes squish it, crush it. Um, so let your emotions that, you know, be reasonable in terms of planning, engage the head, but let the heart, let the emotion drive it. Um, that's really cool. There's so much things I want to ask you about. One of the things is I, I, I love the partnership with Luke. Talk to me about how you have been able to maintain a friendship. Um, cause certainly there are partnerships gone bad in dream pursuits. Um, I've heard enough of those stories of people like I'm never partnering again. Uh, it ruined our relationship. You have been able to be successful now uh, working on this together and appreciating each other's input on it and coming to an agreement and your relationships intact. How did you, how have you done that? Um, we first, we share so many core values. Um, that have nothing to do with business. And I have complete trust in him mm. and he has complete trust in me. Um, and I think that you, everyone starts out that way, but then again, your head kicks in, the world kicks in and you're looking at things like, Oh, well, how did, how did this happen? Why did this happen? And you, and you, um, I think the weakness um, when weakness kicks in, control goes up. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're feeling weak about something or unsure of something, um, you're going to grab the steering wheel with white knuckles. Yep. And Luke and I both trust each other to the point that we don't agree on everything. A hundred percent. There are things that we don't agree with. Mm -hmm. um, however, we trust each other so much that we can say, um, you know, this isn't good or this isn't good, whatever. And, and, and we're done with it. We move on. Um, so I think as it, as it relates to the continued longevity of our friendship and our working relationship and our partnership, which like you said, Jeff is, is, is very rare um, to be able to be, go into friend, go into business with a friend mm -hmm. and still have that work out. Um, it comes from a place of being confident enough in our lives and in our decisions to know that we don't need to control each other. I'm not in control of him. He's not in control of me. Um, and there's no, um, um, there's no reason for either of us. And there's never been an opportunity for either of us to, um, to fall back on that and, 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 and remind each other of anything. It's, it's, it truly just comes from, um, it just truly comes from a, a place of confidence. Yeah. And strength. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. You, um, you are in this business for more than just cigars. Um, you, from the very beginning of this conversation, you talk about a memory with your dad on a tractor. You, you talk about hanging out with high school buddies in a back room with your tie and shirts on it and having conversation, hanging out, um, slowing down long enough to actually engage. You're building, you're actually building community. Um, and you're using cigars. You love cigars. Um, Love the color of them, the feel of them, the texture of them. I mean, you painted your apartment room a color of one of the bands, which is awesome. So um, talk to me about how you have incorporated 
the sense of community and establishing a community feel. You actually talked about also um, making it female friendly so that women will come in. So how have you built community using um, a cigar shop? It, um, um, cigars make everything an equal playing field. Um, if you're on the golf course, you look and see what clubs is this guy playing? How often does he play? Well, what kind of car did he pull up at? This and that. Um, mainly just because you're trying to bet him and you don't want to lose your bet. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> but, not, it, it, but no, you, 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 you're judging it immediately. Um, and you're at a place, you're in the most beautiful landscaping you could be at. You're at a golf course, but you're immediately judging. Um, when you come into a cigar shop, you can come in as a tow truck driver or as a banker or a country music celebrity or a middle manager and sit there with a couple guys and all of the walls break and the playing field evens out. No one cares what you're smoking or how, excuse me, how much it is or how expensive it is there. You're just, um, it just knocks it out. I had a pastor tell me one time he was sitting in a men's group and, um, they started the men's group and no one was talking about anything. It, it, you know, it was just all very lighthearted, you know, weather and sports and men have men go deeper than that. We don't want to convince anyone, that, <laughs> right. but we do go deeper than that. That's and why so, we're in the back room, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. And so he, uh, uh, he said, you know, I took this men's group. We went to the casino. He said, now as a pastor, they all got, weirded out and kind of confused that I was going to take him to a casino. We all stood yeah. around a craps table. We were elbow to elbow, leaning there, throwing dice and having a beer. And people started talking about um, real life. They began talking about uh, great decisions. They began talking about decisions that they regret. And because of the atmosphere change, and that's what caused it. Um, and, you know, you take them out of, you know, you take them out of preschool room B in the church for their, mm. you know, their Wednesday night meeting. Mm. And they're not going to talk about the, uh, the, the lust and the issues that they've experienced. Yep. You put them in a casino and everything's fair game at that point. Um, the cigar store, Short Thing Cigars, is a place that has changed my life and we've changed the lives of others. Um, we um, people come in and there's no in, there's there's no intimidation. They're able to speak freely. They're able to joke around. They're able to tap their toe to a song. And, and when they're doing that, they get real. They get open. They get honest. Um, I think one of the biggest direct um, areas that I've seen that I am most uh, proud of and, and that I love the most about what I've accomplished at Shore Thing is that we have an all female staff and this, and, and so many of them, almost all of them had never smoked a cigar before um, in their life. Um, and it, you know, we, 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 we have, we have them and they have taught us so much about life. I have become such a better person in my marriage and in my day-to-day -day life by having an all-female staff that allows me to understand. Women understand. A stand-up comedian will never tell you that a woman's understanding because <laughs> that's the best punchline, is, it? is that they're not. But mm -hmm. I will tell you from working with them every day that women are more understanding than anyone walking this planet. And mm -hmm. it is so wonderful to have them in there. And they are the understanding ear that all of every single patron that walks in the room um, speaks to. And they are able to talk to them and everything. And it, and it works out great. And the, and the blessing that I've had is that, um, you know, we've had, we've had people that work for us that, um, you know, whose boyfriends or, or, or whoever are in jail or are, uh, we've had, you know, single moms, we've had, um, you know, GEDs, we've had college degrees, we've had, you know, mm -hmm. people that have been physically beaten, things like, I mean, and so what comes in, what gets put on my plate is I become and get to learn and help and coach and empower the staff. 
Uh, I've always said, I want to take care of my brand. I want to take care of my staff and the customer is always third because I have to have a good brand. I have to have a good church. I have to have good employees. Um, and then they are going to then represent me to the customers. Um, customer is not first in my book and they never will be. My staff is most important. Um, oh, wow. And um, so if I hmm. can empower and train and love and incentivize and create experiences and go on trips and do all these different things for my staff, they never come to me and say, Hey, I was wondering if I can extra dollar an hour more. I've never had that question once in five years. If they did, I'd pay them. Not a problem, but they don't ask that question because they're not there. They're, they're, they're not there because of, you know, whatever the comma is on their paycheck. That has nothing to do with it. They, they come in on their day off. They just come in on their day off and sit and, have a they cigar believe, or what? Yeah, they, they believe and buy into the vision, right? They are truly a part of our tribe and it's so amazing. And so the direct impact I've had as it relates to uh, being the pastor of a church without a steeple. Is, I want to, I want to talk more about that. You just dropped the church word in there. Uh, now you're actually describing it. You're, you look at your business as a church. If I, you know, I, when I first moved down here, I did not have a church home. And I had a buddy of mine up in Nashville where I used to go to church say, you're doing it. You, you, you've you got it. You've got people coming in there. They're hanging on to every word you say, or your staff, whatever. And that is the best place for you to do it. And I considered seriously saying on Sunday, you know, on Sundays or whatever morning, come in. And there's a cooler full of beer there when you come in, crack open a beer. And let's just, you know, let's, let's do some reading. Hmm. And um, again, I marinated on it too long and I never did it. Um, but no, I think it's, I think every business has the capability of doing that. What is church? It's, 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 it's empowering and changing lives. Um, you know, take whatever your belief, if you believe in, you know, in God or, or if you believe in bullfrogs, I mean, whatever, you know, whatever it is, if you can sit there and empower someone and give them the confidence to live their life and walk away from negative situations and strive to become something more, then that's what you should be doing. A boss is someone that cares about how you do at work and a leader cares about how you do outside of work. And I want to be the best leader in the world. Wow. Oh. I love um, I love that your your vision for the uh, the life lounge or the the uh, cigar community building um, atmosphere you're creating is way more than transactional. Um, you're not just making a transaction. Sure, you need to run the business. It needs to provide uh, funding for your staff and all of that, and yourself for a living. But um, you you're interested in seeing transformation happen not just transactions happen that's good yeah that's true i like that yeah transformation not transactions and and my dream and my obsession that i have comes from building an atmosphere mm. i have a tremendous appetite for visual and sensory things um and all of those are to be created to to make things real um, and, um, it's just, I think that you create an atmosphere and you, in all of my, all of my design work and what I do is based off of psychology and behavior as far as lighting, as far as scent, as far as textures of things, as far as the temperature of the room, as far as the sound, it's a, every sensory thing is based on, on psychology and behavior. And so if we can put someone in a situation that has been, designed and created for them to feel good about themselves, but not too good that they feel sterile, um, then they now have the opportunity to open up and be, the, be a, a great raw version of themselves. Wow. That's awesome. I, I think we've already heard the answer. I want to give you another chance to, to answer it with this question. A, a lot of dreamers that I work with, um, they come to a realization, they may not have realized it to begin with, but they come to a realization that 
their dream is solving a problem. Their dream is filling a gap or providing a solution of something that's not working in the world the way it's supposed to be working. What is, what is being solved by uh, Sure Thing Cigars? We are solving the problem. We're solving a, a, we're solving a handful of problems, but we are solving a problem of um, comfortable reality. People come here on vacation. They need to feel an attachment and a sense of comfort. Yes, they want to be in a new place, but they want to have a, a feeling of home and comfortability. Mm. We're, we are pet friendly. Bring your dogs. And if you didn't bring your dog, there's probably going to be a dog in there that you can pet. And when you're, you know, if you're scratching a dog behind the ears, you can't think of your friend back home that, that's, that's sitting there with the, you know, at the, at the, at the vet's office or at the, you know, being boarded somewhere. And so now you've got that feeling and you're going to sit there and you're going to do that. And you're talking to people about the dog and where they're from. How old's the dog? I've got this dog. Here's a picture of mine. And just in that one example, the walls came down and now we're talking about life and we're talking about home and when we got the dog and how the baby reacts with the dog. Now we're talking about the kids and you know, it's, it's, we are giving people an area where they can, um, where they can feel like they're on stage and that they are the stars of the show, mm. um, which is our goal. Um, and, um, we want people to feel like they're stars of the show, but we also want to do it just enough to where they feel great, but not so much that they lock down. And there is a breaking point. There is a tipping point there. Um, and so the problem that is the, 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 the area, the problem that we are solving is we are providing an area for people to um, feel the best versions of themselves without feeling uncomfortable. And the world right now doesn't help people do that. No. There's very no. few places where, where that is happening. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we don't talk know, politics. We don't talk religion yeah. at the store, which sounds funny given all the, you know, the, the um, transformational talk I did earlier, but you know, I've got a one-year-old son. We watch Mr. Rogers every night. Um, Presbyterian pastor. He never once uses the word God in the 1,100 episodes he recorded. Hmm. Not one time. But he, but he, he had a way of connecting with people as people and um, celebrating their story. And I love that Mr. Rogers is a part of your part of your journey. Um, every day, there's something really profound about his story and the way that mm -hmm. he elevated people. Really cool. Um, you, I know this is true because my friend um, that connected us actually is a, is a leader and pastor in Auburn, Alabama. And he does some, he does some music gigs with you. So you have a, you have a venue there where you have mus musicians come in and share we do. Yeah. Every, every week we have different musicians come in and, um, and play and share their talents. And we have, um, I love musicians. I absolutely do. I wish that I was one. I can sing. I love to sing, but <laughs> as far as being a musician, whatever I learned on YouTube one day in five minutes is about my extent. And, but we have these musicians that come in. We have, um, we have men, we have women, uh, we have such a diverse um, group of musicians that come in. And I mean, some of them, you know, plays the saxophone and play, you know, it just, it's, it's super cool um, what the musicians do. And it brings a great crowd. Um, and uh, the, the, the area is set up, um, the sound that we have, it sounds so wonderful. We just put an addition on our building to uh, a screened in area that is absolutely beautiful. Um, and the way that room is set up, the music out there sounds incredible. 
So it's outdoors, but it's screened in. It's an outdoor screened in area. Yes. It's got a, it's, 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 it's about 800 square feet out there. It's got a big fan out there and, and TVs, et cetera. And it's such a wonderful venue for music. Um, people walking by can see it, you know, or can, can, can hear the music and everything. And, and it, it's a very comfortable area for people that, um, if they don't want to be seated inside in the actual cigar lounge, they can be seated outside and, and drink some wine and, and it's just beautiful. But yeah, we, we do host live music every Sunday. Um, we do that. And then occasionally uh, I'll get up there and, and put on a little show. And you're doing that. You're doing that uh, this weekend, aren't you? Yeah. Tonight. Tonight. tonight yeah. Actually. We're playing. Yep. Awesome, Absolutely. Man. Wish I could be there. <laughs> You should uh, send a plane up here or something and get me down there. Uh, <laughs> I've known people. I've known people that do that. You know. <laughs> oh my gosh, I would be. That would be a thrill. Um, so, tell me about that two day period of time when you're in the stream, you're fishing with your buddy, you're just. And again, I there's something really powerful about the tactile doing something with our hands that that inspires conversation. You were doing that with your fishing. You did that on the tractor with your dad. You do that with cigars, um, the drink in your hand. There, there's something that it releases the inhibition to, to communicate. Um, but talk to me about, man, we had two days and we were flying down there. We were looking at property or whatever. What kind of fears um, stirred up in you when you thought about really going all in for this dream? I, um, you know, I think the, 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 um, I, I agree. First off, I agree with what you're saying about as far as, you know, the, the tactile um, way of, 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 touching thing you know i i my general manager and i we have our best meetings when we are out of the office mm. i love walking meetings it's one of my favorite things in the world i think that when you're walking or standing you are more creative mm. um and i don't know why i've just always even in in the in the corporate world i would close my office door and i would stand if I was working on a marketing or creative business development plan. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I think it's just uh, um, the energy going through down into your feet, into the ground is a grounded feeling versus sitting. It, it's, yeah. it may be some, it may be deeper than that. It may not have been as deep as that, but to me, when I'm walking and, and, you know, she and I are talking about that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's so much last night we, we, we had dinner. We walked afterwards. We ate too much. And during that walk, I spouted off 11 ideas for an event that we have coming up. Um, and um, so it, it's just, it, it, it's great to, it's great to be doing something, you know, um, whilst just whilst talking about business uh, in the marriage world, they call it uh, recreational companionship. Okay. And the times that you can be out on a kayak with your, you know, husband or wife, and you're doing stuff, you know, again, it takes you out of the situation of, hey, we really need to talk about the budget this month. And now we're floating down the river on a kayak and it's, you know, we should do this. You know, I've been thinking about and you can open up. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's just you have to you have to do that. So in that um, in that two day period, as far as. I didn't you know, what? in all honesty, there there really weren't any fears. I was almost. At that point, I was pinching myself, wondering, is this really happening? Is this real? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, it was, and I mean, for probably the first two years of even owning the business, I just, because I was doing something that I absolutely loved, and in my opinion, we do not encourage going down the path we love because that's silly and that's small talk and you, you know, can't you're, make a living out yeah, of that. You're not going to make a living cars. out of that, yeah. but you should really look at this. You get told that so many times, either directly or indirectly, that um, being able to do something that I absolutely love with such a cool person on the beach in such a cool place, it was just like, man, like, I don't know if this is like a dream. I was waiting to wake up. 
And so like, that was the fear. It was almost like a head game of, is this really happening? Um, and, um, I would, I would like mm-hmm. to know, um, you know, even from, from, from some of your listeners, the people listening to this, if, 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 you know, if people feel the same way, if you find something that you love to do and you get, and you, and you do it and you know, you're going to be successful at it. Is there ever a time that you sit there and you say, is this real? I mean, some of my favorite moments at Sure Thing Cigars are going in early in the morning or very, very late at night when we're not open and touching the walls. Mm. I mean, that sounds odd. I mean, I don't mean to sound like a, you know, like a, like a witch doctor or anything. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not smoking sage in there or anything, but it, it's, it, it, there, there is a, there's almost a, there's almost a, a, again, I guess going back to that tactile feel going in and touching the surface. And that's like, this is it. This is, this is what we've built. This is, this is it. This is amazing. And I have to, I, I force myself sometimes to do that when I get super busy and wrapped up in, in things I love to go in there. One of my other favorite things to do, I love to mop the floor. I know that sounds funny, but I love to, I love to paint the floor and just mop yeah. it. Yeah. I absolutely love it because at that point I am sitting there and I am touching every square inch of my building. I'm yeah. touching every square inch of a building where every person that's come in, every customer I've ever had has walked on that floor and me mopping the, it's just, it's, it's such a great feeling to me. I love that. So the fear was, um, uh, you know, am I doing something wrong because I'm following my dream? I'm following my passion. I'm, I'm not, you know, yeah. being a, a, a corporate analyst, you know, which is a real job. It's a real you know, job. I'm, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm not doing a real job. And even to this day, I still feel some guilt and fear about that. You know, I'm not doing a, a quote, real job. I'm having the time of my life and there's thank, you know, thank the Lord there is income coming in as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's really cool. So the, the, it could be clicking on all cylinders and you still could have the feeling of, should I be doing something real? And I, I love the way that touching the walls and mopping the floor grounds you in the reality that you are doing something real. And that there are people coming in there that are being transformed uh, through community and, and, a, and a safe place and a comfortable place. Um, that's, that's really, really cool. Um, who has helped you? Uh, how have you navigated those moments where you had to move forward anyway? Um, you had to make a difficult choice. It wasn't easy and you pulled the trigger on it and you kept moving forward, who are the people in your life? How, what were the systems in place that kept you moving forward when I'm sure there were days when you said, uh, maybe we shouldn't do this anymore. Maybe I ought to give this up and get a real job. So to think, <laughs> how did you keep um, moving forward anyway? You know, it's uh, Jeff, as you know, from being a, an entrepreneur, when you are at the top, there is no one there to blame you. And there's, for me, because of my love language, there's no one there to congratulate you either. Mm -hmm. When you are at the top and you have a staff, no one's going to say, hey, great job. Thank you for coming in on time. You're, you know, you're making a great pattern in here and it's wonderful. Not one person ever. Yep. Right. And no one is going to say, hey, man, you messed up, blah, blah. So, um, as far as having a support system, um, to be honest, it, what, you know, I mean, cause there, yes, there have been times where I've thought, um, you know, let's just, let's lock it down for a month. Let's, let's step away from this thing. Um, and I think in my line of work, dealing with people so much, um, the people, the customers uh, in the lifestyle lounge there are what motivated me and what supported me mm. to 
stick with it. Never was I saying, oh, I might give this up. Um, I didn't, I would never share that with a customer. But in those days that I was down and I forced myself to go in and I go in there and everyone's just loving it. And, you know, it, the timing of things always works, meaning on my worst days, someone will come in there and say, I follow you on Instagram. I follow you on this. You know, would you get a, you know, can we take a picture? I want to show, you know, whoever back home. And how could you, you, you there's no way, there's no, there's nothing that could pull me away and say that day after that happens. Yeah, I should just quit. And I mean, that's the great thing about, um, about being, uh, you know, a spiritual person is that um, being able to accept and understand and admit when things are not wonderful, uh, which society, again, trains you otherwise. Get a real job and put a smile on your face. Yeah. Um, if you go anti-cultural and get something that you love to do and expose your feelings, strengths and weaknesses, um, things type to, things kind of line up and can be addressed. Uh, again, going back to Mr. Rogers, anything worth mentioning is manageable. Mm. And um, anything mentionable is manageable, I think is how he says it. And so I, um, and again, having an understanding staff and a team, I can, I can express and voice my uh, strengths and weaknesses and vulnerabilities to them. And we work through it and we build each other up and it's wonderful. And, and it helps them. I think in, whenever you're, whenever you're teaching someone, you're also teaching yourself as well. And so if I'm teaching them about this and that I'm, I'm relearning, I'm getting that spark reignited. I'm, I'm doing that. So as far as giving up, um, yes, it's crossed my mind um, more often than I'd like. However, um, whenever I have that feeling, there will always be put something put in front of me that's going to remind me why I do this. Yeah. We talk in the Dream Accelerator about being so clear on your who and your why. Who is, it, who is this for and why? Why is it? And the who and the why, if you got that clarity, that will be the power to keep moving forward anyway. And I love that the timing Every time you were down, there was another who. There was another person that you're like, oh, this is this is the who, and this is why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. So you keep moving forward anyway. That's that's beautiful. Um, I want to give you a last word here. Um, people that are watching this, uh, listening to this podcast, um, they, they have a dream. Maybe it's not two days old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, they're right. ready to go. Um, I was reading something the other day that the decision to go after a dream is an instantaneous decision, no matter how long you've waited for it. So at some point you're going to have to pull the bandaid off and go for it. Right. Yeah. So why not now? Um, so people are thinking about this, they're wrestling with their own insecurities, their doubts, whether they should pull it off or not. And they know they have something that would be a blessing to other people whether it's a book they're writing, a song they're producing, an album they want to put together, um, a painting or a group of paintings they want to put out into the world or starting a cigar um, venue where people can come and experience community, whatever it might be. And they're struggling with the fear of it. What word of encouragement would you like to speak to them today? I think that um, look at it as surgery. That's the best way. Um, the reason why we go through surgery is because we have something that needs fixed or we have something that needs to be replaced or repaired to make better, to live mm -hmm. your life more comfortably and to be able to have more mobility, et cetera, whatever the issue is. Yeah. I, and everyone, is terrified of surgery. There are so many unknowns. There are risks. Mm -hmm. And after surgery, you're not going to feel 100% better. 
because you have to go through therapy mm -hmm. and you have to continue to strengthen those muscles around that spot. Mm -hmm. And you have to fall down and you have to get mad, <laughs> but you have to understand that the surgery was done because something needed fixed. If you are writing a song or painting a painting, then to stare at that white canvas is surgery. What am I going to do? What if I mess up? What if I, all the what ifs. And after you paint the painting, you're going to feel the therapy. You're going to say, what if whoever doesn't like it? What if someone thinks that a color blend didn't work? What if this? But after that therapy wears out, you have the strength and you have solved the problem. Hmm. And you're now able to put the most beautiful thing on your wall or someone else's. And you're able to move on to the next one. And, sec and the second surgery, you kind of know what to expect. Yeah. So when I start the business, when whoever is listening to this starts the business and starts their dream, you're not alone at all in feeling intimidation. And you're not alone at all in, in doubting yourself because your entire life you've been told to doubt yourself. Mm. So don't blame yourself for that. But I think write down, if it's been 20 years since you've had the dream, go out to the garage or go somewhere where you can stand up and walk around or do something and, and reignite that dream. Think about who put that dream there. If, if it wasn't yourself, think about who. If you talked to your dad and said, now, one day I want to open a sporting goods store because we went to that football game. Remember back in seventh grade? You think about that football game and where you sat and how many jackets you had to put on because how cold it was that day. <laughs> and the first time someone had ever spilt beer on your foot yeah. and the smell that you went home with. And it just you think about that. Think about what caused the dream. Mm, and funny. that's going to get your excitement back up. Because the dream, like we said, like you said, Jeff, is coming from the heart. The emotion. Get, yeah. get your brain out of the way. Get your brain out of the way. Man, get your freaking brain <laughs> out of the way. Get Absolutely. out of your head. Absolutely. I have this thing uh, right over here. Uh, you can't see it on camera, but it says, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so important yeah. for me because I get in my head and uh, talk. I can talk myself out of a lot of stuff. We can oh. love. We can love so much stronger than we can think. Wow. Our heart is much bigger and much more powerful, especially in my brain. <laughs> we, can, <laughs> we can love so much stronger than we can think. So get back to the love so, and just chase. I love it. Man, that is so great. Thank you for the encouragement. You've encouraged me to go go out and move, go out and run. I have my best thoughts when I'm on a long run, actually. Yeah. So uh, Corey and I share that love yes. of running when we've had some of our greatest moments running together. Um, he's way better than I am because <laughs> he's got way more endurance. But yes. anyway, um, thanks for the encouragement, brother. It is a joy to meet you. I, I am looking forward one day to walking into your walking into your cigar shop and uh, sit down and have a great conversation uh, with somebody. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Somebody who is just there and I want to listen and I want to hear their story and I might even pick up a cigar. Absolutely. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to, I want to ask you, where can people find out more about Shore Things, Shore Things Cigars? Um, where can they go to find out more about what you're up to? We are most active in social media in Instagram and Facebook um, at sure thing cigars. Um, our website is where we have all of our, uh, excuse me, all of our product um, or a good amount of our individual exclusive products. Luke's cigar, the one that I blended our sure thing cigar, um, a lot of our merch, but as far as being our friend and being familiar with us, when you walk in the door, follow us on, on Instagram or Facebook at sure awesome. thing cigars. Uh, and we, uh, all our, our staff is always on there. So it's going to kind of, when you walk in the door, you're going to feel like you've already had a, you already have a friend. Love that, man. That is really good. Hey, have, just have a spectacular tonight, tonight with my friend, <laughs> I will. um, we'll have tear a good up time. the place, uh, yes. lay down some great music and thank you for the way you have encouraged him. Um, 
as one friend to another, uh, I'm just so thankful that you're in his life. And I know it's, I know it's a mutual thing. So it is. It just does my heart really, really good. And someday I'll be down and meet you face to face. Thank you. All right, man. Mr. Jeff Meyer, thank you for everything, my friend. You bet. Have a good day. You too. Hey, fellow dreamer. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Head over to my website, jeffmeyer.org, for all of the show notes and links. And when you're ready to move from overthinking about your dream to actually taking action on it, consider joining the Dream Accelerator community. Our clients are getting crystal clear on their dream with our Dream Generator Vivid Description 5-Step Process. They're discovering the truth about fear and how to use it as fuel to take courageous steps in the right direction. And most importantly, they are walking a clear path forward because they have made an investment in themselves to confidently realize their dreams. The results are so inspiring. Having coaching and companions on the dream journey is crucial. Remember, fear will come, fear will stay. Move forward anyway.